The call came in just after 11 o'clock. 911. I need help. My husband was shot. His wife was there. Kamaya Hassel was there, kneeling down next to Sergeant Hassel, hugging him, covered in blood, uh, crying. Hey, 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 back up! Whoa, 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 whoa. Very upset. No, 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 no. He's at, he's at the hospital right now, and uh -huh. Tyrone, everybody's up there. Uh -huh. um, I'm going to be honest, it does not look good. Oh, okay. no. He was the pride of his family. He shot up the ranks and made sergeant at an incredibly young age. You wait and wait and wait for that time for that boy to grow up and become a man and become your friend as well as your son. And it was all taken away from him. The evidence will clearly establish that Jeremy Cuellar is a full-blown psychopath. I can tell by the way you look, man, you want me to burn in hell, sir. And I understand that. This guy got into you, he got into your head, you guys are working together, he's playing you. That gun was never in her hand, but her fingerprints are all over this murder. So yes is the answer to the question. You are also being a manipulator in this situation, correct? I guess that's a fair statement, yes. And without those statements, the prosecution has no case against Kamaya Hassel. This is what he's going to tell you. How to get out of that situation. And I grabbed the gun. He's trying to no. find the first place to put a body. No, sir. The only thing they could do was kill him. You want to say anything? We, the jury, need to find the defendant. New Year's Eve, uh, the call came in just after 11 o'clock. 911. I need help, my husband. Hello? Hello. Yes. I need help, I need help, my husband, my husband was shot. I need help. And at that point, it's a massive response by police agencies from all over the area responding to that call. The victim was a 23-year-old U.S. Army Sergeant, Tyrone Hassel III, shot while on holiday leave to visit his family in Benton Harbor. His distraught wife, Kamaya, called 911. Did you see anybody around? <laughs> Ma'am? Okay. When the officers got there, Sergeant Hassel was laying on the ground, slumped up against his truck. Obvious gunshot wounds to his head and neck area, gunshot wound to the sh shoulder area. His wife was there, Kamaya Hassel was there, kneeling down next to Sergeant Hassel, hugging him, covered in blood, uh, crying, very upset. Hey, hey, hey back up! Do you have any idea what happened here? No, he just brought us something to eat. Okay. So we sit on the couch eating, and then I just heard gunshots. Okay. And I ran to put my son in the room, and I came outside, and he was laying on the car. Okay, how many gunshots did you hear? I don't know. I just heard a lot. Do you have any idea how this happened? I'm not sure. I mean, this is serious, okay? I don't know what his condition is, but it does not look good, okay? So, if you know something... I don't think he was beefing with anybody. Now's, now's the time. Then Sergeant Hassel's father, Tyrone Jr., arrived on the scene. You know who he is? my son. It's Tyrone What's... Hassel III. Tyrone Hassel III. <laughs> Seeing what I saw, I see my son on the, on the gurney. I can see the whole in the front and the back of his head. I was just hoping that some way, somehow, they would can save his life, but I knew he was dead because his, I was looking in his eyes and his, it was no motion. He's at, he's at the hospital right now, and uh -huh. Tyrone, everybody's up there. Uh -huh. um, I'm gonna be honest, it does not look good. Oh, okay. no. At first, the police were just trying to really, you know, contain the scene, preserve all the evidence, and try to figure out what's going on. A couple options that they originally thought could have been a robbery. I thought that somebody may have tried to take his truck. He had a nice truck. He wore a nice jewelry. Uh, people knew um, he was in the military. And, and 
Ben Harbor is kind of a um, very low income city and I thought somebody was just trying to get an easy come up. There's evidence on his body. This may be a robbery, dude. We need to know if he had money. We didn't know if, you know, go to the hospital, will you? But after some, you know, real quick digging into it, that didn't seem to be the case because Sergeant Hassel still had his wallet with him with money. Uh, his phone was with him. Keys to his truck were right there. So nothing appeared to be been stolen. All right, ma'am, we need to we need to secure these yeah. people here. We got to collect some evidence. I don't know what the hell's going on. Ma'am, you got to come out here with us, okay? Come on out here with me. Right. I'm not I'm not trying to say anything by saying this, but I have to ask, okay? Nothing was there he's drugs out here? Like, was he doing a drug deal? Or? No, nothing that he's told me. I don't. My son don't have no file, anything. He don't have a record. He told me yeah. a long time ago, Daddy, if I go to jail, somebody no. framed me. My son right. walked a straight line his entire life. So whatever happened, happened right here, huh? The bullet casings telling a story. There's one, one, two, three. And then number four is right there. Four, maybe it was four. Uh, two to the head, one to the neck, one to the shoulder. I would, the, whoever shot him was either laying in wait or walked up on him because they shot him right up next to his truck right outside the door. It was a point blank shot, I'm sure. Somebody knows something. The next route the police were looking into was possible mistaken identity. Maybe they thought the, the victim, Sergeant Hassel, was somebody else uh, when the shooting took place. And police soon learned from his friends and family that the sergeant's younger half-brother, Benny, had been running with a bad crowd. More than likely, that was probably, Benny was probably the target. He just happened to step out at the wrong damn time. If I had a guess, that's what my theory on this whole thing is. Sergeant Tyrone Hassel III was pronounced dead on New Year's Day. A cruel ending for the life of a young man who had worked so hard to make it out. In, in the city of Ben Harbor, there's trouble everywhere you go. Trouble will find you. He stayed out of trouble because he stayed so busy. He ran track, played baseball, got good grades, and had lots of friends. Sergeant Hassel, everybody just described him as a guy that makes you a better person. Got an academic scholarship to go to Grand Valley State University. He was doing what he needed to do to better his life. While he was at Grand Valley, he decided he wanted to serve the country, and he enlisted in the Army. And immediately when he was in the Army, he shot up the ranks and made sergeant at an incredibly young age. I talked to some of the people in Army CID, and they said, yeah, you don't make sergeant as fast as he did. It was a good fit, especially after falling in love with another soldier, Kamaya. I thought she was great. I mean, I loved her like a daughter. And then the young couple was deployed to Korea, serving in separate units, living in different barracks, standard policy for the U.S. Army. It seemed a happy marriage that got even better with the arrival of a son, Tyrone the Fourth, nicknamed Chunk. He just loved his family. He loved Kamaya, treated her like a queen. All he wanted to do was serve in the army and take care of his family, and did the best he could at it. Home for the holidays, he told his father how happy he was, happy with the army, happy with his family and always happy to know he would soon be having some of his father's home cooking. He was dancing, thinking about that deep fried turkey and macaroni and cheese and dressing. I thought he was gonna be uh, a very successful young man, a very successful father and family member. I mean, he did things that, at that age, that it took me years and years and years to do. Uh, he was the pride of his family, uh, and really just the pride of his friends and the community around here. Just a, a great, great man. But the murder investigation was about to reveal that not everything was happy in Tyrone Hassel's life. The family wants to find the person responsible for a New Year's Eve shooting that left a 23-year-old active military member dead. You don't know why this will happen to him, so we really, really want to know why. As detectives returned to the scene in daylight looking for more clues, there was still no answer to that question of why Tyrone Hassel's son was murdered. We're still working it. We've 
don't have much right now. Police showed the heartbroken father surveillance photos of possible suspects pursuing the mistaken identity theory that the real target had been the victim's half-brother, Benny. I've talked to Benny, man. Benny, Benny's got something he's holding back. Hey, Walt, how are you? I'm ready as ever. <laughs> How are you as ever? Down the block, a neighbor came forward to report a suspicious man parking his car just before the shooting. Because he was here, what, two or three days ago and parked night, there. The same way. Yeah. There are a lot of tips coming into the police on this case, and they followed up every single one. And uh, they did that for about 10 days. Tip after tip coming in, they just kept following up on them. But after talking with dozens of friends and family members, all right, all right, good luck, man. Yeah, and even the half brother, Benny, nothing panned out, and the mistaken identity theory was dismissed. But I always kept saying, man, this, this ain't right. This is personal. And when they said that they probably thought it was a case of mistaken identity, I said, no, because whoever did that seen his face. And then the family's public pleas for help paid off. There was an anonymous call that came in to the St. Joe Township Police Department. Why you think this happened the way you do? I'll help you with that. And it was a woman uh, calling saying, you need to take a look at people within his own battalion and platoon who may be responsible for this. So they were in, they were all in Korea. And that's where it started. Claiming Sergeant Hassel's wife, Kamaya, was having an affair with another soldier. He and the girl had a relationship going on and that the guy that dad had said something to him, so they had words, and then he had threatened him. And what I think I heard you understand is this relationship started in Korea and there was a uh, words exchanged or a confrontation between the husband, Tyrone, and the killer there. Right. I don't know if it's there or here. The only thing is that the funeral is tomorrow. You guys should look at the wife. So now the investigation quickly shifted to Fort Stewart, Georgia, where Tyrone and Kamaya were based, a place that held some dark secrets. There were two Army specialists that came forward in Fort Stewart to their criminal investigation divisions and began to give a statement about what took place. One of them revealing that Sergeant Hassel had learned his wife Kamaya was indeed having an affair with another soldier. You said Hassel did know there was something going on between the two of them. Yeah, her husband caught her. Okay. The other soldier allegedly having the affair with the victim's wife was identified as Specialist Jeremy Quayar, known as Quay. What did Quay say about uh, did he ever talk about her while he was on leave, anything like that? He just can't wait to get back to the States so he can get a divorce from his wife. And then another soldier revealed he had sold Quaylar a Glock pistol just two weeks before the murder. I don't know how to use it, so I'm about to unload it, load it, clean it, take it apart, assemble it, put it back together. It was more than enough for Armory investigators at Fort Stewart to place Jeremy Quayar under arrest. Gotcha. And, um... Now, we brought you down here um, for a reason, okay? Um, have they told you or informed you anything about why you were picked up last night? Okay. But Cuellar cut off any questions after being advised of his rights. And at this point in time, do you wish to have a lawyer? Uh, yeah. But he apparently had already talked plenty with another soldier in his platoon. And he said, I did what I had to do. I went up there and I took care of it. Uh, he talked about the number of shots he fired, what gun he had, how it came about in the driveway of Sergeant Hassel's family. So the next question was what about Sergeant Hassel's wife, Kamaya? She had already been at the police station days earlier, in tears, offering to help find her husband's killer. But she made no mention of the affair or her lover, Jeremy. Did she know what he had done? What, what happened with something on Facebook? Yeah. They contacted... Sergeant Hassel's father, Tyrone Hassel II, and said, we need to talk to you. Can you bring Kamaya down with you to the station? So when I walked up to her, I said, hey, we got to go to the sheriff's department. She was like, okay, come on. And we walked in, and we walked in. He was like, Kamaya, you go right here. Mr. Hassel, you have a seat right here. And they took her behind 
a secured door, came right back to me, and he said, um, Mr. Houston, go home. It's gonna be a long night. I kinda like slowly walked away like, what the heck just happened? Kamaya was indeed in for a long night, about to be questioned by State Police Detective First Lieutenant Andrew Longusky. We didn't know if we had a boyfriend who was maybe obsessed with her a little bit and acted on his own because he was saying that he had committed the homicide or if she was actually involved. The detective began with questions about the affair with Jeremy. What was going on? Did he just start working you? Was it, did it start in Korea? Is that where everything started going? Because there's no doubt about it. This whole relationship's going. In Korea, that's where it started. Like, we weren't sexual or anything, but we were really close. But you are now. We are really close. You guys were probably sexual somewhere throughout all this. You have to be to have this kind of, for him to get this hold on you, he's had a breakthrough sexually to you, I'm guessing, first. Not even, not even just sexually. It's just, I just was feeling so bad, like, with Todd, like, Nothing me not wanting to be with him, but just, just how I was being treated. I was just feeling so bad. And it's just like he was just there, like, listening and everything. Like, he listened like it, he, he listened to me, and I, and I felt like with Todd, it was times where he couldn't, you know, he wouldn't listen to me. And she was very well-spoken. She seemed to be very believable as far as she was sad that her husband was gone, um, told me that she wouldn't want to marry again because nobody treated her as good as her husband did. And she denied knowing anything about the murder to Detective Longusky, who had been chosen for this questioning because he was also the chief of the polygraph unit for the state police, an expert with the lie detector test, which she then agreed to take. I think she wanted to prove that she wasn't involved. Back at the Hassel home, her husband's family had no idea what was happening, why it was taking so long, well past midnight. Fine, I'm like... This is exhausting. I got to get up in a few hours to go bury my son. And nobody's telling me anything, and his wife is over in, at the sheriff's department. I'm concerned about why they have her over there, but I'm still not convinced that she had anything to do with it. Because, uh, like I said, I loved her like my daughter. And I was worried. He would know what was going on in just a few hours. On the surface, she looks like a nice young lady, you know, a military person. But the lie detector showed Kamaya Hassel was deceptive, was not telling the truth about her role in the murder of her husband, Sergeant Tyrone Hassel. Once I went back in the room to actually confront her, it's probably within a half an hour that she's kind of changed her story 180 degrees. And he coaxed her along with words of sympathy and understanding and a false claim that Jeremy was blaming her. You are not the one pulling the trigger. You need to get out front of this for your son because you have a future. And I'm telling you, when they come and talk to me, I want to be able to say, hey, I gave her a test. Would she be involved with somebody? She saw that this occurred. Without a doubt, you are, but don't let him put you underneath the bus because that's where it's going right now. Because this isn't something you planned. This guy got into you, he got into your head, you guys are working together, he's playing you, and I don't mean it in a bad way, we all get played. We've all been in that situation because we have problems. She relatively quickly started to uh, expose not only her you know, conspiracy to do this, but also she was kind of a major player as far as making it happen that night. So um, when we were in Korea, I, don't, I can't really pinpoint exactly when it was, and then I had this big argument, and then you know, I came back and to and I was talking to Jeremy, I'm like, man, I don't want to be with him no more. Like, and he was like, I can handle that. And I was like, you know, what do you mean by that? He was like, I can handle it. When I get back, I get a gun, blah, blah, blah. It turns out that Jeremy Cuellar had come to Benton Harbor several nights before, driving in from Chicago. He staked out Sergeant Hassel at a local nightclub, but there were too many people around to pull it off. Jeremy getting cold feet? I don't think he was getting cold feet because um, every time that he would come out and wasn't able to do it, it was something like that. And on New Year's Eve, Kamaya was sending Jeremy text and Snapchat messages about her husband's whereabouts. And then he was he was out there and he was watching the house the whole time. I told, him, I told him that he was bringing us back from the And that's when it happened. Kamaya that night playing the role of the distraught, grieving wife. Would you say this is a 50-50 you guys were on this? Yeah. 
because okay. I knew all about it. And I, like I said, I, I probably could have stopped it, but the reason that I didn't because I felt like he would, you know, be mad at me or... And not love you anymore? Yeah, because I just felt like I wasn't getting that love at home like I wanted to. But detectives believe there was another important reason. Sergeant Hassel's military life insurance policy that would have paid her four hundred thousand dollars. The money is part of it, yes. Okay. But main reason being is because I just felt like if I would have called it off, like Jeremy probably would have like been upset at the fact that I called it off, and I I didn't want him like mad at me. Okay, but you understand though, calling it off would have saved your husband's life. You could have divorced him. Was Ty a bad man? Not bad enough for this. And honestly, that's just like my remorse. That's really how I feel. I believe you do. I don't believe you do it today. But you know, you put your needs and your wants above somebody's life. I did. $400,000 is not what Ty is. It? Yes, you felt it was over four. Would you say that's a fair statement? Yes. Yeah. The night of the murder, and for more than a week afterwards, Kamaya Hassel had denied knowing anything about what happened. Now, ten days later, at three in the morning, Detective Longussi had achieved a full-throated confession. So, as far as that, are you sad that you, you planned this out with him? Yeah, um, it, that's why, even though I wasn't being 100% truthful in the beginning, that's why I kept saying Would you say he, you weren't 100% truthful? That's a... That's a kind of a major 100%. You were, because of you were saying that 25%. I mean, would you agree that? I mean, you, yeah. that's, that's huge. I mean, I almost think with these guys... You, but that's why I was, when I kept saying that, if, with what I know now, if I could, I would go back and not do it. I wouldn't even talk to Jeremy at all, knowing that everything would have gone like this. But Jeremy was going to go and you called him back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I get why you called him back. I mean, knowing now, what do you what do you think should happen to you right now? I don't know. Because myself I feel just as guilty as him. Detectives came to the Hassel home to break the news in person. He said we we solved your son's case. I was like, who was it? He said it was Kamaya. And my family just went into an outrage. And I was still I, I think I was still in denial. I didn't, I didn't want to believe it. I couldn't believe it. It was like, it, no way, no way possible. But then when he told me that it was her lover that did it, I was like completely blown away. Kamaya Hassel and her lover, Jeremy Cuellar, were both charged with first-degree murder and the death of Sergeant Tyrone Hassel. I lived with this person for 11 days after my son was killed. My entire family comforted this person. We took her in like one of our own. She was the person that, you know, that was behind my son's murder. Do you have any idea what happened here? No, he just brought us something to eat. Angry wasn't even the word. I would have killed her. Instead, he would be the first witness against Kamaya Hassel when she went on trial for murder. We are in the case of Michigan versus Kamaya Hassel, who was charged with plotting with her lover to kill her husband, Tyrone Hassel III. Prosecutors decided to put Kamaya on trial first. Her lover, Jeremy's trial, would follow. I, th I thought we had the stronger case against her uh, with the statements made to the detective. But there was concern about the optics. She was a very sympathetic defendant in her appearances. She looked incredibly young. She dressed for court, did her hair in a way that made her look almost like a teenager. Thank you, Your Honor. You may begin with your opening. The woman responsible for that killing is seated right there, the defendant. You'll find she had murder on her mind and betrayal in her heart. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here today as the defendant, Kamaya Hassel, 
wasn't happy with her life and with her husband. And she devised a plan with her lover, Jeremy Cuellar, to have him murdered. And in the end, you'll see from the evidence, it was all about her and what she wanted. It was kind of a case where you put everything out there right away from opening statement and really just keep the foot on the gas the whole time and not let up. The evidence is never going to put the gun in her hand. It was Jeremy Cuellar that pulled that trigger, but it was at her direction. That gun was never in her hand, but her fingerprints are all over this murder. Kamaya Hassel's lawyer, Chris Kessel, sought to portray his client as a victim too of a crazed lover and unfair police tactics in gaining her confession. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no question that Sergeant Hassel's death is not just sad, but is a tragedy. Convicting someone who's not responsible of murder, that is a tragedy too. Jeremy Cuellar is directly no question about it, responsible for Tyrone Hassel's death. But I think the evidence will clearly establish that Jeremy Cuellar is a full-blown psychopath. But it was Kamaya Hassel's videotaped confession to Detective Longusky. Myself, I feel just as guilty as him. That was the biggest challenge for her defense lawyer, after first trying to keep it from the jury. They did their best to try and prevent it, but it's admissible evidence, so there wasn't much that he could really do to prevent that from coming in. So Kamaya Hassel's lawyer told the jury he would prove the detective manipulated her and wore her down to get a false confession in the middle of the night. It's only then, after she's been poked and prodded, not literally, but it's only at that point, after hours and hours of denying that Kamaya Hassel makes this statement. And that's important, ladies and gentlemen, because the essence of this case is that statement. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Jimmy. The prosecution began by taking the jury back to the crime scene that New Year's Eve, as seen through the eyes of its first witness. Mr. Hassel, your son murdered at your home in the driveway New yeah. Year's Eve, 2018? Yes. It was the first time he had seen his daughter-in-law, Kamaya, since the day she was arrested. She never made eye contact with me. Never, not once, actually looked at me in the eye. Uh, so I was just thinking, I don't know, she was heartless. For him, time had stood still since that night. When I arrived, it was the paramedics was already there. And when they lifted them up, I saw my son back of his head explode out and his eyes were open. I looked at him to see where he was shot at. And I saw a hole right here. Judge, I have no questions for Mr. Hassel. Thank you, sir. You may step down. And Mr. Perangelo, you may call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. We will call Detective Andrew Lunguski. Probably the best evidence uh, to come forward is really Detective Linguski with his confession. And so we're going to play that video. Um, but essentially, can you tell the jury the basics of what she told you, sir? She told me that she did uh, plan it with Jeremy and that they had tried on several occasions uh, to make it happen. Uh, we admitted the confession and essentially just played a 45-minute straight-through video of her giving all the details. She never once told you she said, no, don't do that, did she? No, she did not. And then in writing, Kamaya initialing the key statement. Yes, the first question I asked was, did you plan with Jeremy to kill Tyrone? Her statement was yes, so I put it in quotes. And then we came back later and we have her initial it. And then I asked her how I treated her, and I had to write a 10 out to the side, 1 to 10, on how I treated her. And then we both signed and dated at the bottom. Nothing additional. Thank you, sir. 
Now the moment defense lawyer Chris Kessel had been waiting for, as he tried to show his client had been tricked by the detective with this false statement. Don't let him put you underneath the bus, because that's where it's going right now. Because this isn't something you planned. You said you got to get out in front of it because Jeremy is going to throw you under the bus. Do you remember saying that? I believe I did, yes. You actually said that Jeremy was in custody at one point and that he was talking. Do you remember saying that? Yes, I did. You have no idea if he was making any statements about her. Yes, I have no idea. Jeremy, in fact, never made a statement, refused to answer any questions. And at this point in time, do you wish to have a lawyer? Uh, yeah. And had never implicated Kamaya. You said Jeremy was a manipulator, correct? I made that was a theme that I used, yes. And you said it repeatedly, is that right? Yes, I did. All right. But it's fair to say that you're doing your own version of manipulating during this interview, too, is that right? Well, I'm trying to make her feel comfortable and give her an option or a way to explain something that she may have been involved in, yes. So yes is the answer to the question. You are also being a manipulator in this situation, correct? I guess that's a fair statement, yes. But the prosecution had another card to play to show the confession had not been the result of the detective's tricks or manipulation. Hello, this is a call from an inmate at the Berrien County Jail. A phone call Kamaya made to her mother right after she was arrested. The prosecution's last piece of evidence. What's going on, Kamaya? I'm in the jail. Why are you in jail? Because I, I, I knew what was going on. What you, what you mean you knew what was going on? I knew what was going on with her. You what? I knew what was happening. Kamaya, are you serious? You gotta be kidding. I'm serious, Mom. I just knew that you would be disappointed. I, I just felt Maya, like... I, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Girl, you're 22 years old. And these people come out and tell you was living a double life and you done had your husband killed, the father of your child, and you talking about I'd be disappointed? No, I'm disappointed in this. Maya, is somebody coercing you to say this stuff? Because that this sounds like a TV show, a dream. No, they're not, Mom. I can't hear you. No, they're not. But but did, did y'all think y'all could get away with that? Thought that was good. The prosecution rested, and all that remained for the defense was to decide whether Kamaya Hassel would testify. <laughs> Members of the Hassel family had packed the courtroom, waiting now to hear if Kamaya would take the stand and try to explain herself. First thing I would want to know is why. I didn't see any anger within their marriage, but I didn't even see any problems. I would just want to know why. After everything that we've been through all together, why would you do that to my family? Ms. Hassel, is it your decision today to testify, or do you wish to remain silent? I wish to remain silent. Okay. And basically, you can have a seat, ma'am. That's to this day, she still hasn't shown any remorse. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go directly into closing arguments. First, we will hear from the people and Mr. Crangelo. Thank you, Your Honor. Aiding and abetting. She is just as responsible as Jeremy Quayer. She needs to be held accountable, same as Jeremy Quayer, because she is just as responsible. She assisted in this crime. She gave aid. She gave counsel. She procured it. She abetted to encourage it. All the evidence shows that. And she conspired with him to do it. And then prosecutor Steve Perangeli again played the key parts of Kamaya's interrogation tape. Her confession. Myself, I feel just as guilty as him. What else shows that this was planned out ahead of time? Her own statements to her mother. What? 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 It, it, was, it was planned in Korea. Surely, she was not giving a false confession to her mother when she said, we planned it. After that point, I don't think there was very much else the jury needed. Hold her accountable. Agree with her that she is just as guilty as Jeremy Coyle. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kessler. For the defense, the task was to somehow undercut the power of the interrogation with Detective Longusky. He is by far the best that I've ever seen. No question about it. He is as skilled an interviewer as I have ever seen. And that is the whole case, ladies and gentlemen. 
The whole issue is, do you believe that Kamaya Hassel made those statements because she had been manipulated by a pro? She had been denying all of this stuff for days, weeks, hours, and it was only after Detective Longusky went to work that she changed her story. The statement that she made implicating herself was the result of a long stay in police custody, followed by repeated denials, followed by manipulation again. Detective Longusky's agreed upon word. And without those statements, the prosecution has no case against Kamaya Hassel. And I hope you return a fair and just verdict in this case. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. The jury returned with its verdict first thing the next morning. Please be seated. And the record will reflect that the jury is back appropriately seated in the jury box, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to ask if he would open that envelope for us, please. I'm going to ask, sir, if you would please read in count one your verdict. Guilty of first degree premeditated murder as aider or better. Thank you. And as to count two? Guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree premeditated murder. All right, thank you. She was very stoic, emotionless, real no reaction from her. Even as she realized what was ahead. Life without parole is the mandatory sentence for first degree murder. But the case was far from over. Prosecutors knew there would be no justice without a conviction for Jeremy Cuellar, accused of actually pulling the trigger. So Jeremy's case was set another month down the road, and we were ready to go with that case. Uh, again, I felt the evidence was very strong. Including the testimony of his fellow soldiers about buying a gun just before the murder, how his phone tracked his travels on the interstate to Benton Harbor, and that a new piece of police equipment actually spotted his car's license plate. And it was picked up the night of the murder, just a couple hours before the murder, which put him in the area around the time of the murder, which was very important. Plus, a judge ruled that Kamaya's own statements about her one-time lover could be used against him. His lawyer asked for a plea deal. I believe that he deserved to spend the rest of his life in prison. And we came to a term of years of 65. And he agreed to plead guilty to second degree murder. So he'll be eligible for parole when he's 90 years old. After Mr. Cuellar pled guilty, he was walking out of the courtroom he looked back to Tyrone Hassel II, uh, Sergeant Hassel's father, and said some words about, I need to talk to you. A few days later, Tyrone Hassel agreed to meet with the man who killed his son. How you doing, sir? I'm all right, um, you know, under the circumstances. And I just wanted to know what was going on um, in his head. If you got something that you want to say, I'm, I'm, that's what I came here to listen to. We do have an hour. I might as well just tell you how everything went. I mean, are you okay? Are you comfortable with that? I'm okay with it. No, it definitely wasn't easy. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he told me way more than what I wanted to hear. Cuellar blamed it all on Kamaya and her plan to get her husband's $400,000 in life insurance money. Man, she, want, she wanted me to do it, man. Like, and I ain't gonna lie, I wanted her, you know what I'm saying? And she, man, she, she knew what she was doing. She wanted the money. So I don't know what she, that's crazy. That's fucking crazy. I, honestly, I was blind. Like, I, I was blinded. You know, I, I thought that was love. You know what I'm saying? No, 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 no. And what about Kamaya's tears when she saw her husband shot dead in the driveway? I was just wondering if she talked to you about that afterwards. I mean, yeah, she did. Matter of fact, she did. She was like, yeah, like, you know, he died in my arms. And she was saying she was sad about it. And I'm like, then why'd you have me f do it then? Like, you know what I'm saying? But she was just like, you know, it's, it's cool. Like, man, she knew what she was doing, man. She a good actor, man. She a good actor. She knew what she was doing. And I, I was too stupid to see it. You know what I'm saying? Honestly. 
The father struggled to hold his emotions in check. I mean, you murdered my son, and then you, like, you, you actually touched my grandson. I could tell by the way you look, man, you want me to burn in hell, sir. And I understand that. I understand that. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, I really hope you can forgive me. You know what I'm saying? I know it's going to take forever, or you might not. But you know, I really hope you can. True enough, you killed my son, but I don't, I don't think... I, I, I know I'm looking at somebody that had a twisted mind at one point. You know, you seem like a good cat. And um, I hate the situation had to happen, especially I hate it had to happen to my son. I'm never gone. The only thing I could do is visit him in the grave. After about 50 minutes, the father's meeting with his son's killer was over. Tyrone has a warning, Quayar, about what was to come for him. Well, man, I appreciate you talking. I appreciate your remorse. You know what I mean? But I don't know how much, um, how much you know about me or how much you know about my son, but... Um, you're going to meet a lot of friends in there, bro. It's, we, if they from Ben Harbor, 90% of them know us. And um, we very popular. I don't know if Kamaya told you about, you know, about us or whatever, but you're going to meet a lot of friends. How should I take that? I mean, I'm just, I'm just telling you. He's going to have it hard in prison. He got sentenced to 65 years. You're going to do 365 days for 65 years. It was justice because I don't think he'll make it out. It's still in me like it was yesterday. I'm far from over, but I'm working on myself. You wait and wait and wait for that time for that boy to grow up and become a man and become your friend as well as your son. And that was my friend. You know, I, I waited so long for that day and it was all taken away from me. I had just got what I waited for for so long. 